Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fifth and final talk wrapping up this week's Make an Impact series. If you've been keeping up with the talks this week, welcome back uh, for the last time. But if this is your first time tuning into the talk series, please do check out the Make an Impact YouTube channel, which has all the previous talks uploaded. So while we're waiting for a few more people to tune in, please do go ahead and use the chat box to tell us where you're coming in from, maybe what course you study or what you've enjoyed about the last week of talks. Sorry, I was muted. So, <laughs> hi everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the fifth and final talk of the Make an Impact series organized by Aishna Shah. If you haven't been able to watch any of the other talks this week, please note that they're all uploaded on the Make an Impact YouTube channel. I highly recommend that you do watch the talks. I personally watched them all and I really think that the speakers offer some super valuable insight into work and general life that would pertain to a much wider audience than just third years or Sussex or development students. So do go ahead and check those out. Um, firstly, I'd just like to quickly premise that any inappropriate comments, hate or discrimination will not be tolerated. And that by signing up for this event, you have agreed to comply with the Sussex Student Union zero tolerance policy. So uh, I'm Alia and I'm a third year student of international relations and development at Sussex. And I'm so honored to be able to welcome tonight's speaker, Chloe Mukai. Chloe is a great example of pursuing your passion and making an impact through harnessing opportunities. She studied photography and environmental management and now works in the very unique sustainable fashion industry. I love fashion, but we all know how corrupt the industry can be today, both with material and labor. And working as an assistant photographer in the fashion industry, Chloe noticed these exploitative patterns, particularly in trade. And this led her to reorient her career path so that she now works at the intersection between fashion and sustainability. Chloe is an ideal example of how you can use your degree or your passion to build a meaningful and rewarding career path for yourself. After her presentation, there will be a Q&A session for the last 20 minutes or so, but please do feel free to ask questions whenever you think of one. We should hopefully be able to address most of the questions in the time that we have left in the end. So I hope you enjoy the talk. Please do engage. And without further ado, Chloe, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Alia, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Chloe Mukai. I am a senior program officer at the International Trade Center Ethical Fashion Initiative. So for those of you who don't know, ITC is a, a joint agency of the UN and the World Trade Organization. And I work in a program called Ethical Fashion Initiative, EFI, and specifically on a project called EFI Culture. So I think I would at this point like to share my screen because I prepared some slides to share with you. Um, here we are. So um, the program that I ma manage is called Ethical Fashion Initiative and uh, Culture. So what the EFI does in a nutshell is we work with artisans from disadvantaged communities by uh, enabling them to join the international fashion industry. So we do this by setting up networks uh, in every region where we work. We set up a social enterprise that interfaces the brands, but also organizes production, organizes training, um, manages compliance, takes care of sourcing. And we have a huge local team that does this in all the different countries where we work. So currently we have 
projects in Afghanistan and Central Asia. We run several projects in uh, Africa and many more places. So uh, the core of EFI's work is this. We produce um, sustainably made products for the international fashion industry. This program, which started in 2008, has expanded quite a lot. And uh, today we work in more countries and we've also expanded to other creative industries. So the specific project I'm working on right now is um, uh, engaging with creative actors from other industries. So we work with videographers and photographers. We run an accelerator for African designers. In fact, we just launched our, our call. We scout and mentor uh, young designers from Africa and help them set stage on an international scene. We have a talent scout program called Opportunities Are Here, which is a, um, it's in the model of a reality TV show where we identify entrepreneurs from creative sectors and provide them with incubation and seed funding. We have a lot of events and exhibitions and yeah, it's a really exciting program. I, I have to say I'm, yeah, no, no two day is the same. Um, a little bit about my um, career and my pathway. So I was born in Tokyo and I was uh, of a Japanese father and a French mother and I went to international school. I always really enjoyed traveling and as a younger child, I didn't quite know what I wanted to do, but I knew I would want to travel and I knew I wanted to have experiences. Um, and so shortly after uh, graduating from high school, I decided to study photography. I was fascinated by fashion and I thought photography would be a good thing. And I did it, I think, deep inside knowing that I wouldn't be the next great photographer, but it was kind of, you know, what I found uh, to do at the time. And throughout my studies, I worked um, quite a lot as a photographer's assistant and a stylist assistant. And I also worked as a um, editorial assistant on magazines. And it was a lot of fun, but I also felt that there was something lacking and there was something shallow that really bothered me. Like I, I couldn't understand why we would spend so many resources and so much money to create one image that people would just flick through a magazine and it would get discarded. So I knew there was something else that I should explore out there. Um, and when I was 23, I decided to move to Uganda to work as a photojournalist. I was offered a job and I worked for uh, the national newspaper there called New Vision. I also um, worked for NGOs like Doctors Without the Borders and I was kind of trying to part ways with fashion, but it quickly caught up, caught up with me. Uh, and I, I hope you can see my um, the screen, but I was offered a job to be the editor of a magazine called African Woman. African Woman was a East African magazine um, <clears throat> about fashion and lifestyle. And you know, at 23, I thought this was the most amazing thing happening to me. So of course I said yes. And I did that for two years, uh, interviewing businesswomen and artists and uh, you know activists and and traveling. I went to Cape Town Fashion Week. I went to Cameroon, and it was a really amazing time. And it's actually when I was in Uganda that I came across uh, the International International Trade Center and the Ethical Fashion Initiative. And it just, um, yeah, it was just incredible because it the the. EFI program, the Ethical Fashion Initiative, just merged these two worlds that I, I was so fascinated with and that I respected so much. On one side, fashion with all the creativity and the, you know, the beauty and the innovation that it entails. And then on the other side, making an impact. So um, I applied for a position and in 2009, I moved to Geneva to work for ITC and I've been uh, working in this project ever since. So this image that you see was like one of the highlights of my of my um, you know my career or work. It was when in 2012 we hosted Vivian Westwood, who came to uh, to develop a collection, but also shoot a photo campaign in Nairobi. And it was a, a trip that we organized, and it was a really amazing experience. Um, while I was working and progressing in the organization, I also decided to pursue a master's. So I started studying with the Open University and I had a, got a master's in environmental management. Um, 
Aishna asked me to talk a little bit about um, what impact means to me and what impact, um, you know, how we can have impact. So I think for me, impact is really about contributing to bring a positive and durable change in the life of the disadvantaged. Um, and I think this is what EFI's mission is ultimately about. It's about focusing on the disadvantaged and seeing how we can best support them and how we can best help them, you know, bridge to other worlds and other networks. Um, those who can get ahead on their own don't need support from outsiders. And I'd also like to say that it's quite easy to have a one-off action, but it's very hard to make a positive change last. And there is many good reasons why people are stuck in extreme poverty. Uh, it's the product of entrenched historical, political, and, and, and social systems. So changing them takes time and it takes more than a project and more than you know one initiative or one action, and it doesn't always work out but it's important to ingrain these seeds and I definitely want to be part of that change and I, I, you know, I don't see myself doing anything else. Um, now, two projects that I feel um, really proud about in terms of impact and things that I've worked on specifically is one, the HAP project that we set up in Haiti. I, I moved to Haiti um, we've been working in Haiti since the earthquake in 2010, and I've been managing a project from Geneva since 2010, but I moved to Haiti in 2015 to set up this project, and we work with different artisan groups. There's a lot of creativity in Haiti. There's a lot of things you could be doing, and there was also a lot of other um, organizations working, but this um, HAP project was particularly dear to me because there is a huge community and many, many communities, in fact, of women who know how to do that, who have this skill of weaving and who know how to make these amazing hats, but they have no education, no access to market, no, you know, not the quality required. And so we really set up this project from A to Z. We brought in trainers from Ecuador. Ecuador, for those of you who are um, hat you know, who like hats, uh, Ecuador produces the best Panama hats in the world. So we went to scout the best Panama hat makers and we invited them to Haiti. They came three times to help support on, on technical skills like weaving and how to treat the fiber and how to block the hats. We also had blockers come from Brooklyn, New York, who taught them how to block the hats and give them the, you know, the shape they need. And these ha hats were marketed in luxury stores all over North America. And so, yeah, that's one project I'm really proud about. Um, another project is um, initiative is our project in Burkina Faso. Uh, this was more recently. So I, I lived there for two years between 2018 and uh, just about a year ago. We have a big textile project there. And although ITC was already working in Burkina Faso, um, this was really about setting up the whole infrastructure. So, you know, going from purchasing equipment and creating all the infrastructure, the basis for the project, but also things beyond that, like getting all the community leaders to come together and um, having discussions, having meetings, having collaborations. And the project in Burkina Faso today uh, exports fabric to brands like Camper, brands like Lueve, brands like Vivian Westwood. So that's another project I really, um, yeah, I'm quite proud about. And I actually have a short video here that I hope will play. Yeah. Bakum <laughs> Um, 
Um, oh, sorry. Oops. So, sorry, before we get to there. Um, so yeah, that was the video about, uh, it's a video that we made. Um, we created this whole series of videos called Meet the Makers, showcasing the skills and kind of honoring the artisans that we work with. So there's a whole series with Burkina, Kenya, uh, Central Asia. They're really cool. You could go and check it out. We have a YouTube channel. If you just look for Ethical Fashion Initiative YouTube, you, you can see all the videos there. Um, what are some of the challenges uh, faced in creating the impact I wish to see? Well, like I mentioned earlier, creating impact is complex because um, extreme poverty and environmental issues also depend on all this ecosystem and all these other elements sometimes we have very little control of. And for example, if I uh, go to the HAT project, you know, we can, we can be successful in, in, in planning for a project and doing a training and, and, and you know, meeting this, these buyers who will buy the hats and doing all of that. But there are so many other elements that are very um, important and that, like I said, we have very little impact over like, you know, the global economy and what retail is doing. And, and even on a smaller level, like the fact that this group in Haiti you know, they had no road to get to Port-au-Prince. So even just simple thing as communication and transportation, all of these have uh, big impacts on the success of our initiatives. Um, and I think, you know, I, I should mention also, because we're talking about fashion here, is that the Western world has been so used to buying things for very little money from stores and being so used to buy things so often and at such a cheap price. Like when you present a product which really reflects the real price, the price, you know, of the person who made it, who was paid like a, a proper wage and all the different things that it entails. Well, in the end, like things get quite expensive, but Western consumers, uh, unfortunately, are too used to buying lots of things for very little money. So these are some of the main, you know, the key points that are limiting our impact in some way. Um, and then, of course, the fact that all these projects, unfortunately, you know, they, they last for a few years, like four years, five years, six years, but to have long lasting impact, it, it, you know, it, it takes time, it takes generation, it means, you know, deep changes in how society functions and how, you know, systems work. So, yeah, that's my take on uh, some of the challenges of having impact. So. I wanted to share some key takeaways um, from my experience and that I drew, you know, from how um, kind of my unusual path to where I am now and my past, you know, the past 11 years of me working in development and uh, working on all these projects with so many different people. So the first one is always say yes. So always offer to volunteer, always you know, propose to, to take part in a project, always get as much, especially when you're a student or when you're younger, get as much work experience as possible because people will remember you if you're committed and excited and enthusiastic, people will remember you. And even if you meet them again later, you know, it's important to, to have this experience and it's important as part of a networking um, creating network networking opportunities and also you know drawing from my experience it is all the work that i did being you know a second assistant photographer which is basically making tea which made me realize actually i don't want to be doing this this is not where i want to be in 10 years i have to do something about this i have to move on uh the second one is to keep learning and stay informed i mean it sounds so basic but especially in the space of sustainability and impact Things are changing so much. And the wonderful thing with so many things being digital, there are so many ways to learn for free. Uh, there are so many courses, there are so many lectures. And um, yeah, it's important to keep learning and to stay informed and to stay on top of what's happening in the world. Um, the third one, which is maybe quite obvious given uh, what happened with me, is don't be afraid to change directions, right? Um, 
what you decide to study, you can decide to ch to to change and to do something else, uh, which is what happened for me as I studied photography and I'm doing something completely different now. Not to say that I don't use the skills that I gained when I was in photography and some of the, you know, I've learned so many things in, in my, during my student years that I'm using even now, but I think it's okay to change directions and I think it's okay to look for something different. And, you know, in our work, like I've met medical doctors who became entrepreneur slash designers and you have so many incredible um, stories of people who change directions. So yeah, don't be afraid of changing directions. And uh, the fourth one is what goes around. By this, I mean, just in, in general, you know, be um, open-minded and kind and, and interested in uh, the people around you, even if um, they're not important people, or even if, you know, it doesn't mean much at that time. I think what goes around comes around and um, all these worlds are quite small places. So you always end up meeting the same people. And I think it's really important to be kind and to be respectful and nice with the people, the people that you meet and the people that you work with. And then the final one, which is also quite obvious, um, grow your network. So meet as many people as possible, network, and um, you know, don't, don't be afraid of um, offering your services or, you know, asking for a job, like, don't wait for the job to come for you. Like, you can also ask for, you know, I want to work as part of your organization because I think you're doing great things and you never know, you try a hundred times and it, it works out one time. So yeah, these were my key takeaways um, and a little bit about my story and a little bit about my views on impact and a little bit about my work on uh, sustainable fashion. Um, thank you. Thank you, Chloe, that was such a good talk. I found that so fascinating. Um, I'm just gonna read out some of the questions that have been coming through. So one question is, do all the fashion products that you've worked on use natural fabrics in production and have any involved recycling of fashion? Uh, sorry, was, yeah. There's so much synthetic fabric which is thrown away and is not biodegradable. So how is that result? Thank you. Very good question. Um, we try to. Um, we try to, and we're doing that more and more. But yes, almost all our project projects work with natural fabrics, and we really favor uh, locally sourced fabrics and locally sourced materials. So for example, in every country where we work, we do a mapping of what's available locally and also of the, the, the production processes. So um, to give you an example, in Burkina Faso, we work in cotton, which is fluvial cotton. So it's not cotton that requires irrigation. Um, it's, you know, hand-picked, hand-spun, and we favor natural dyes. And we also, you know, one of the, the big investments that we make is also in the water affluence system and how the, you know, the cotton dyeing is processed. Um, in Kenya, we work with recycled materials, like recycled, like all the Vivian Westwood bags, all the hardware is made from recycled uh, metal pieces like faucets and like car parts that are found from um, the, the landfill and recycled. Um, we avoid synthetic uh, materials. In fact, um, I don't think we use any synthetic materials. And we're trying to look at more and more projects that are involving uh, recycled materials. So um, I could say, for example, some of the designers that we're working with as part of our accelerator program, um, one in particular, he does only uh, bags made out of recycled denim. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> I thought that was a really good answer and honestly not what I expected, but so that's really good to hear. Um, another question is, in your opinion, what are some of the ways forward to expand sustainable production on a global scale without compromising ethical values? Um, I think that's a really tough question because, um, you know, it's about global economics and it's about a lot of other things, but I think one way that we could really create change is just by creating more information and making people more informed and making consumers more informed of their choices. And I think this 
is actually happening right now because there is a huge movement um, with young people and consumers who are curious, who are interested and who read their labels and who actually ask brands. And so we are more and more like investing also in labeling and providing information about what we make and how we made it and where it was made and how, you know, who were the people who were behind the production of this. So I think um, kind of keeping consumers engaged and answering their questions and making things transparent, I think that will contribute to, to growing the sustainable fashion uh, space organically and making sustainable fashion kind of the, the norm that any brand should be transparent about what materials they've used, how they've, uh, you know, what the production processes was and uh, who were the people involved in, in the making of it. Okay. Yeah, that, I think that builds on um, another question about how to change consumers' mindsets towards living more sustainably. So, yeah, yeah, same thing. I think it's about uh, you know sharing these stories, and I, 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 I think this movement is coming, and I think consumers are changing, and I think especially like the newer generations, like young people wouldn't mind paying more for something that's like a nice product, of course, because everything starts from product, but that is made well. Like it really gives like an added value that they're willing to, 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 to pay a little bit more for. Um, and I would also like to say like, it's been interesting because we get, um, we get lots of emails from brands and designers wanting to work with us all the time. And I really noted that we are having more and more requests and more and more demand from younger designers that are coming from fashion school or that are you know just graduated or just starting their brand and they want to start that from the foundation of their business so whereas um earlier on in our program like when we started in 2008 2009 we were working more with big brands and this was part of their CSR, like their social uh, corporate responsibility project to be working with us. Now we're working with a lot of brands where it's like their core DNA is to work sustainably. Um, another question is, do you have any future projects that coming up that you can tell us about? Um, future projects uh, that I can tell, <laughs> yes. Well, we have, um, so we have all these amazing stories, right? Like uh, you saw the video that we did and we work with a lot of great videographers and photographers and we do a lot of collaborations with artists. And um, yeah, I, it's very exciting. I We have a podcast series and the next, um, the next series, so we launched last year in 2020. You can also find this on our website by the way, and the podcast is available on Spotify and iTunes for free. But the next series is entirely dedicated to Africa. So we have, I can't disclose the names, but we have an amazing lineup of activists and environmental activists and artists and also fashion designers and entrepreneurs and business people. And this will uh, be launched on March the 11th. So that's a kind of exciting project I can share. And um, yeah, we just launched our accelerator call. So um, this is also a project that's really dear to me. We support uh, designers from Africa to, you know, the business model that I was talking about earlier is really international brands that want to produce in Afghanistan, Haiti, and these places. We also support designers from Africa who are producing in Africa and who are creating jobs in Africa to be part of the international stage and to be part of this global economy. And we just launched um, the call. So we're uh, taking applications until the end of March uh, from designers from several African countries. This information is also available on our website. And um, yeah, you will hear, you'll learn more about this. That sounds really interesting. Um, really looking forward to yeah. it. Um, so someone's asking, are you currently working on any projects related to circular economy? Yes, actually this is one uh, project that we're working on that, and uh, to answer the earlier question by Mathilde, um, this is something that we will be hopefully disclosing next year. We have a 
an idea for a circular economy project because we do believe this is the future and we do believe like this is the direction the initiative would like to go into. Okay, so uh, Una is asking, what measures have you taken to overcome Westerners' addiction to fast fashion? What are your solutions to convince people to pay more for more ethical products? Thanks, really good uh, question also. Um, I mean, yeah, I think this goes back to a little bit what I was saying earlier. It's like about educating consumers and educating people that, you know, you just cannot buy a, a, a t-shirt for $5 and think that there is not something right in it. Because if you know how much it costs for the material, how much it costs for the sewing, how much it costs for the overheads and the labeling and the, you know, somewhere, some, someone along the line is, um, is not getting, you know, the, the, the not being paid fairly or something is not quite right. So I think a lot of what we do is around education. And so we give a lot of talks in, universities and, and schools, especially to fashion students about this. Uh, we participate in a lot of dialogue around fast fashion. And what are our solutions to convince more is to tell the story and to be transparent and to, you know, educate people about fair wages and, you know, the, the you know, even just the video that I showed earlier, I think it shows kind of the depth of work that is required to create one fabric. You have to you know, get the cotton, spin it, dye the yarn, weave it. Like if you just imagine that to set up a loom to weave, it takes three days and two people to set up a loom because it's like really um, time consuming and, um, and it's work that requires a lot of skill. So I think when consumers know this and know the amount of time and the amount of investment that's been made to make something, then they feel like, okay, this is worth the price that I'm paying because actually there is a lot of care that was put into this product and it's gonna last me a long time. Thank you for that. Um, the Dante is asking, to what extent does your development project work with the private sector? Um, to what extent? Yeah, we, we, I mean, we, we work with the private sector all the time. Like all our partnerships are with uh, private sector companies and brands. So actually this is this has been kind of our, our strength is we have a big network of actors from the private sector who partner with us to work in Kenya and Uganda and Haiti and all these different countries. So we bring them in, we, we develop uh, products together and we guide them through the process of working in these places and the idea is the hubs that I mentioned earlier that we set up and that we co-manage at the earlier stages of our project then continue to operate independently and continue to work with these partners from the private sector. Could you do uh, private sector? Sorry, Ailea, I didn't uh, hear the last question. Could you repeat that? Um, I was just asking if you could give an example of, um, of a company in the private sector that, that you guys oh, worked with. Vivian Westwood that I, I, I showed her on the slide. So she has been, we celebrated uh, last year in 2020, the 10 years of collaborating with her. So Vivian Westwood has been working with the uh, ITC Ethical Fashion Initiative for 10 years. She's, since the moment we started partnering with her, she's produced a collection in Kenya and also um, sometimes involving some of her other projects, but without missing a season, she's been working with us consistently for 10 years. And we had a you know 10 year anniversary celebration last year. So this is one example. Uh, all our partners from the private sector are listed on our website. So you could actually go to see and also see the collections and see what uh, the kind of products that we're making with them. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is, have there been any cultural challenges and boundaries contextually throughout your work with the people in the communities that you work within? Thank you. Yes, um, 
important point. Um, and actually, that was one of the things I wanted to mention uh, when I was talking about the challenges, uh, the, you know, the cultural norms around work um, for every project, we have to kind of adapt to that and, and learn about it and work around it. So um, yeah, to give you an example, um, the the project that we're running in Burkina Faso, it's uh, it's in the form of a consortium. So it's in the form of like a set of cooperatives that work together and they're all women led and managed by women. And it's mainly women who are um, who are working in all these different workshops. And it's been a really um, it's been really important to make this a success to understand how this group worked and this group was able to work together and you know some of the complexities of the the cultural norms around work and around interaction and around hierarchy and around communication uh, so i think how we've been able to maneuver through this is that we have really strong teams on the ground so we have really big teams of uh, local staff and consultants and experts and technicians who work with us and who um, who help us navigate through these uh, challenges. I hope that answers your question. Oop, Alia disappeared. Um, so I will just carry on answering the questions. Louise is asking, this movement is a lot about durability and good quality. With this in mind, how will seasonal fashion trends change? Um, well, I think that season, you know, seasonal fashion will slowly transform to become seasonalist fashion because everyone travels. I mean, not right now, obviously, but I think more and more and more people are traveling. So it's not like maybe before where you had a winter uh, wardrobe and a summer wardrobe, and with the effects of climate change uh, and and traveling and you know this concern on sustainability. I think globally, fashion will you know morph into become seasonless, and you'll have timeless pieces or pieces that you can transform from one season to another, um, and like have as you say like be beautiful products that are well made and that are long lasting that you can wear throughout the year. I hope that answers your question. We can't hear you, or I can't hear you. Sorry, my mic was muted. Okay, it's great. Um, sorry, I think uh, Alia's having a few internet issues, so I'm just okay. going to step in. Sure. Her. So I actually had a question for you. I know that you are a freelance photographer in Uganda. Mm -hmm. What are your tips on being a successful freelancer? Um, on being a successful freelancer, well, you know, it's kind of like you have to, it kind of links back to what I suggested in my takeaway. It's like always say yes and always network and always uh, put yourself out there. So I was really lucky when I was in Uganda, but I, I just, I kept meeting people and, you know, proposing my services. And I also didn't wait for them to come to me. I proposed them. So I did a lot of work. So that was at the time where I kind of wanted to part from working in fashion and I wanted to be like a news reporter and, and do more photojournalistic work. So I would um, find my own subjects and own issues that I was interested in. And then I would go to see NGOs and propose it to them. And I actually uh, had an exhibition for Doctors Without Borders about the night commuters, which was a big issue in the Northern Uganda. Um, children would commute at night to to stay in a safe place because of civil unrest in the North. But um, yeah, I would find my own subjects and just be really proactive at putting myself out there and saying, I can do this. If you you know pay me even a little bit of money, I will go and do this. And um, yeah, I think 
I think that's really important, like not to be shy about saying, I'd like to try and, you know, if you can't pay me, I do it for free. Of course, if you can. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, we have a question from my father. Okay. <laughs> uh, I was asking if you could please sure. explain your impact measurement methodology and how do you communicate the impact you achieve with consumers and brands? Sure. So we have an impact measurement methodology to measure the impact of projects, but also of orders on the communities where they are. So every order, say a Vivian Westwood orders 2000 bags, what's the impact of that order on the people that were making them? So to do this, we have social workers on the ground. We have a team on the ground who do baseline studies to, to, to kind of comprehend the profile of the artisans, who they are, how many children they have, how much money they earn, how big is their household, what kind of house they live, if they have any health care. And, and then we're able to uh, track what the order, how much they earned with the order and what they did with that money. If it went towards education, towards housing, how we communicate, well, we give, um, so we communicate that internally within EFI and kind of our reporting, but we also um, produce impact reports that we share with the brands that we work with. And we also um, put this on the product. So a lot of the products that we make in collaboration with the brands have all or some of this information on the swing tags. And we also make uh, disclose everything on our website. So. Um, consumers who buy an EFI bag made in Kenya can access this information. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, we have another question. Earlier you mentioned that you changed direction when you joined the Ethical Fashion Initiative. What skills helped you navigate this career change? Um, sure. Well, I did a lot of courses and I did a lot of uh, training on project management, which uh, I'm lucky is offered in my organization, the International Trade Center. But I also, as I mentioned, did um, a part-time master's with the Open University and I did training um, at the time it was called more CSR. I think now we're changing like the terminology of all this, but yeah, I did a lot of training on CSR, on environmental management, on standards, on project management. Um, I also must say I learned a lot from my peers and like from more senior people in my organization. I think that's really important and that there's a lot of things that you can learn through studying and at school, but there's a lot of also soft skills about how to manage things on a day-to-day -day basis and how to you know, deal with complex situations, especially when you're on the field. So I've learned a lot from uh, yeah, my peers at ITC. Wonderful, thank you so much. I think we are going to wrap up the Q&A session now. Um, so yeah, that was super great and um, such a lovely way to, to end the series. So thank you so much, Chloe. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to say a few closing remarks now. So I just wanted to say, first of all, um, that I'm so thankful for everyone who's been part of this project. And obviously, a massive thank you to all of the speakers throughout this week. Your talks were so fantastic and, you know, very informative, very inspiring and, you know, very insightful. And I know that it's caused a lot of people to reflect on their future careers and to really think about where they want to be and how they want to be the pioneers of positive change. So huge thank you to Yupka Mitrinovska, Stefan Zarai, Eliza Roadcup, Golnaz Ikhani, Alejandro Ortega, Daniela Arias, and last but not least, Chloe um, Mukai. And obviously a huge thank you as well to our fantastic moderators throughout the week. Um, so Shima Langan, who did a fantastic job at kicking off the series, Spike Azri, Ella Maher, Carmel Kalani, Charlotte Gray, and Alia Ali. These are all dear friends of mine, and I'm so proud of them. So we also have some people behind the scenes that we need to thank. So I really am so thankful for my family. They've been so supportive in this project and endeavor. And also a huge thank you to everyone who helped promote the event and get the word out there, such as the Students' Union, the Business School, the School of Global Studies um, at Sussex, 
And of course, the biggest thank you, it obviously goes out to the audience. You know, you're the reason that this project was so successful. And I really hope that it's allowed you to, to really reflect on um, what you want to do in the future. So please keep a lookout for more on this project. I'm going to be developing it and hopefully hosting some, some other talks in the future. And just a little announcement, tomorrow at 11 a.m. GMT, we're going to do a part two of Yupka's talk, the, the woman who spoke on Monday, to get to some of the questions that she wasn't able to answer and also to allow her to um, finish her presentation. So you're welcome to join or the recording will be up so that you can watch it later. And all of the talks are online on the YouTube channel and on the Facebook page, and you're welcome to refer to them whenever you would like. Um, you can also message me on LinkedIn if you have any questions for me. And uh, Chloe, I don't know, are you happy with people adding you on LinkedIn? Absolutely, I'm more than happy. And um, yeah, it was really nice to, to speak to all these this audience and I wanted to thank you also for inviting me. I think it's a great, really great platform and it was really well organized and I was really happy to be here. But yeah, anyone can add me on LinkedIn and um, I can also share more information about our work. Wonderful, there. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone. Bye, have a good weekend.